All right. Would you uh, pray with me before we get started in God's Word? Let's pray together. Lord God, uh, we know that we desire and long for your presence. We want to be in your presence. We want to experience your presence. Father God, Holy Spirit, we need to hear your voice this morning. Not the voice of a preacher, but your voice, Lord. So please, Lord, translate these words. Send your spirit here to move among us and speak. Speak, Lord, your word. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Do you know what this is? A book with maps in it? Ever seen one of these? Some of you old people know what this is, right? Yeah, the kids are like, what in the world are you doing? This is called an atlas, folks. This is what we used to use when we went on vacation back in the day, remember? You used to take this thing out and you could look at the big picture of a state and you could see all the different roads. You could pick, plan out your map and you could have your whole trip tick thing and you carry the car with you and it would just trip, trip tick you along. It was amazing, wasn't it? Amazing. This was an amazing thing. I used to have one of these in all my cars. I used to have it in my closet. And before a trip, I'd sit and plan out my routes and have it all written out. It was like amazing. Now, of course, we have a new thing that we use. You know this? Yeah, Google Maps. How can you possibly get along without Google Maps? Now, notice the difference between Google Maps and this atlas. The Google Maps, you can see just the little streets around you and just see your route, right? That's it. You can't see the big picture. You have no idea you know, where you're really going. You can just follow the little directions. In fact, you can set the voice to be Australian, English, Irish, female, male, whatever. If you want a voice talking to you, it'll just keep talking to you and tell you where to turn the whole way. It'll give you this perfect little directions. Now, I'm going to tell you something. My kids have never used one of these things. They don't even know what it is. They wouldn't even know how to use it. If I gave them an atlas to hear playing your trip, they'd be like, Dad, what are you doing? I got Google Maps. But I can tell you something I've noticed about my kids. They are clueless on the big picture of directions. My daughter Lena left Wheaton going to Oak Brook Shopping Mall to get a book. When she came out of Oak Brook Shopping Mall, she typed into Google Maps an address that she thought was back to Wheaton, but it was the wrong address. She called me from somewhere east of here saying, Dad, I don't know where I am. I'm lost. I'm following Google, but it's taking me the wrong way. So I said, read me some of the streets around you. And she read me some of the streets. I said, Lena, you're like in Maywood. You need to get going the other direction right now. <laughs> Quickly, please. Right? Clueless. Absolutely no big picture idea of what a map looks like or the grid of Chicago or which direction is what. That's because, you know, an atlas gives you a bigger picture. Right? It allows you to see the real map. You know where you're going. You know kind of where you're headed. Whereas Google Maps, if you follow the directions and you get it in there wrong, oh man, it's a total mess. I just did this this week in Arizona. I had my Google Maps going the wrong place and oh my goodness, I was driving all over Arizona. Now I wonder, I really wonder if some of us in the church have lost the Atlas vision, the big picture vision of what this is all about. If we've instead adopted a Google Maps version of our Christianity. We've lost sight of maybe the big thing that Jesus was after. I think the people in Jesus, they had the same problem. They lost sight of, they didn't realize, they forgot why the temple was there. They forgot what the law was about. They forgot what the purpose of the sacrifices were. And they got this Google Maps focused thing going on where each one picked their pet little thing that they thought was it. And when Jesus came on the scene, he blew all this open. And he said, this is not about these little things. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the reign and rule of the Lord. It's about the healing of the world, the restoration of all things. It's about returning people to connection with their father. That's what this is really all about. Now, I think there's lots of forces at work today in our churches that give us a narrow Google Maps view of what Christianity is all about. One of them is consumerism. We come here and we think that our tithe is like our ticket price, our ticket admission. We give our tithe, we paid our admission ticket, and now we get to dictate what this is all about, how this works, what we need. We want it to be good for us, and we have each of us in our minds what good for us means, true? Yeah. I know what songs I like. I don't like certain songs. I know what sermons I like to hear. I know what things I want to have happen. 
makes our picture super small. It makes our Christianity all about us and what I need, what we need individually. Right? A second thing that's out there is there's still a religious spirit among us that says for church to be church, it has to have these certain things done in a certain way, in a certain order, with certain decorum. If we don't have those things, somehow we're not really doing church. Interesting. There are some here who think that Sunday morning is it. You just come on Sunday for an hour and you've done your whole Christian faith thing. When the reality is, Jesus said we were making disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you know what Barna just released? A report on discipleship. It shows that over 50% of Christians sitting in churches are not involved in any kind of discipling relationship. Helping each other walk and follow Jesus. And even less, even a fraction are involved in discipling anyone else. Helping them to follow Jesus. I, I, I'm afraid we've lost some of the big picture. If I were to go out this morning with a microphone and start interviewing each of you and say, what's Christianity all about? What would your answer be? What would you say? What would come out of your mouth first? What's this we're doing here? Why are we coming to church and doing all this stuff? What's this all about? Well, our passage in Luke today, from Luke 13, I think, uh, you know, Luke has no problem understanding the main point of what this is all about. And before we get to the actual passage, I want to set some context, because in Luke 13, 22, we find out what Jesus is actually up to. So look at this. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. On Ash Wednesday, when we were here together, Pastor Greg read a passage from Luke 9, about Jesus resolutely setting his face toward Jerusalem. Why was that? Because Jesus knew that the culmination of his ministry, the big picture of what he was here for, the reason he came, was to go to Jerusalem, die on a cross, and resurrect from the dead and save the world. So he was on his way, pressing toward Jerusalem, when we read this passage. So as we, as we jo join him here in Luke 13, he's pressing on, heading towards Jerusalem, and this is what happens. Let's check this out. At that, same, at that time, some Pharisees said to him, get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox that I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and the third day I will accomplish my purpose, my big picture. I'll show him why I came. Yes, today, tomorrow, and the next day I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. Now, i got to tell you, as I read this passage, I was thinking to myself, what is the deal with the New Testament? What's the deal with these people? Everybody wants to kill Jesus. Have you ever noticed this? I mean, it's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, some of the people, and now here is this guy, Herod Antipas, wants to kill him. I mean, this is a guy who's healing diseases, preaching good news, telling people to love their enemies. He's kind, he's loving to everyone he meets, he shows no interest in setting up another kingdom of his own. He, he wants nothing to do with overthrowing the Roman government. But everybody wants to kill him. It's crazy. But he, here are the Pharisees of all people are warning him, Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Now, I don't know if you know who Herod Antipas is. He's the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the ruler that was in place, put there by the Romans when Jesus was born. He dies in 4 BC, a couple of years after Jesus is born. And his kingdom is given to three of his sons. Herod Antipas is one of those sons. Herod Antipas rules in the, in the area around Galilee, which is where 80% of the Gospels actually occur. So 80% of the Gospels occur in Galilee. This is where Jesus carries out his ministry, right? And Herod Antipas is the ruler there. So what is the deal with this? Why does he want to kill him? Well, we could say, well, maybe Jesus is getting too much attention and Herod Antipas is jealous. He just wants to get rid of him. Possible? Maybe we could say, well... Uh, you know, he's paranoid like his father was. Herod the Great was super paranoid. Super paranoid. Hated the idea that anyone else could usurp his power. So maybe he's got his same father's same paranoia. Maybe he wants him dead because Rome is pressuring him to keep the peace, keep everything good here, maintain order. But all that is a Google map vision of what's going on here. There's a bigger picture happening. Do you know who stands behind these these earthly rulers, these earthly people that are trying to kill Jesus. It's the heavenly forces, the heavenly uh, demons in the heavenly realms. The spiritual forces that are at work in places we can't see. 
And they are motivating these people to take out Jesus. They want Jesus dead. Because they know that Jesus is the center of God's plan. They want him dead. You think this is new? Herod the Great tried to kill him when he was a baby. Remember that? He went to the village of Bethlehem, killed everyone two years old and younger, based on the wise men's story and timing of, his, of, their, of their star they saw. Right? The religious leaders have tried countless ways to take him out, to trap him in something that they, they could say he said so they could accuse him and take him out. They all want him out. Why? Because the religious, these, these spiritual forces are, are wanting Jesus taken out. Why is that? Well, because, folks, the answer is Jesus. The whole thing, this whole thing's all about Jesus. Christianity, the church, the church's activities, it's all about Jesus. The enemy knows if he takes Jesus out, Christianity is never born. The kingdom of God never comes. God plan, God's plan fails. Now, what the enemy didn't know was that God had hidden from them his ultimate plan. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians. Check this out. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Do we get this today? Do we get that this is all about Jesus? Do we understand that? That Jesus is the main point? That the person of Jesus is the main point? That the reason we sit here this morning and even do church is because the person of Jesus is the main point. Everything else is secondary. Worship, prayer, justice, Bible study. I can go on and on. Outreach, it's all secondary. Jesus is the main point. Peter Grieg, champion of the 24-7 prayer movement, says this. Satan is not particularly interested in sin. His primary objective has never been to tempt you into violating a particular set of rules. His number one aim is simply to divert your attention away from Jesus. He'll use sin to do it for sure, but he's equally able to use busyness or shame or pain or religion or TikTok or Instagram or an obsessive relationship or a golf handicap or a pay raise or an illness to distract you from the Lord. Satan hates the fact when we fix our eyes on Jesus... Broken relationships, broken things are fixed. When we love him all, all of our lives, then even death itself can lose its sting. I love that. It's all about Jesus. That's why these people want to kill him. We got to get this. So why do we worship? Why are we sitting here this morning? We worship to give glory to Jesus. To fix our eyes on Jesus. We've learned to worship our worship. But that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be worshiping our Jesus, to wonder at the person of Jesus, to come here together, to be amazed at the person of Jesus and celebrate what Jesus is doing among us. That's why we worship. I get to be in Jesus' presence. When I'm in his presence, I smile, I bow, I sing, I lift my hands, whatever it might be for you, so that I can give Jesus his due. I can do this with a lot of stuff. I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of Jesus. So I go to, in, to Jesus in prayer because I know that Jesus has the power to help me when I'm in need. Jesus is the one. Justice without Jesus might not even be justice. At least not the kind of justice he was after. No, the restoration of all things into a relationship with the one who made them, making all things right, that's something only Jesus can do. The mission of God, outreach, running around serving people without Jesus, who cares? Let's close up shop. The VFW can do that. So can the local businesses or whatever, the food pantry. But we're doing it in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the one who moves us out of our seats each week to do these amazing things. He's the driving force beyond everything we do as a church. Satan knows if he can get our eyes off Jesus, then he's won. He's made us irrelevant. He has taken away the resurrection power, the presence of God that can change the world. Do you know why Chris Landcamp works in the darkest part of the city of Chicago? Because Jesus told him to. Do you know why Jane Lorp started Little Lambs and now she 
Because Jesus told her to. Do you know why Pastor Burt goes to Angola prison in New Orleans multiple times a year? Why our prison ministries are visiting prisons all over the era? Because Jesus told them to. Do you know why Nurmay Missions is building schools in Africa for kids? Because Jesus told them to. Do you know why Alan Harriman goes to Honduras over and over and over again in spite of all the obstacles and trouble? Because Jesus told him to. Jesus is moving the church. He's directing his followers to build his kingdom. But before we do great things for Jesus, the most important question is, are we in love with him? Do we know it's all about him? Are we abiding with him? Are we connected to him? Are we deeply in love and relationship with this Jesus? Because it's all about him. Now you might be wondering, why is it all about Jesus? I don't get it. What's going on with this? What does Jesus do for me? Well, the second part of Luke 13 helps us with this. Look at this. This is at least part of the answer. This is Jesus speaking. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often have I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings? But you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house is abandoned and you will never see me again until you say blessings in the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is mourning over Jerusalem. God has sent her countless messengers. The word of God has shown up there with thousands of people and they just kill them, stone them, ignore them, get them out of here. He, he, God's tried to call them back to himself, but they were like, no, no thanks. The line that stands out to me in this passage more than any is when it says Jesus wanted to gather them together like a mother hen under her wings. But it says... You wouldn't let me. That kind of reminds me of Psalm 91. Check this out. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says this about the hens. Now, I've shown you this before, I think, but the rabbis in Jerusalem have a way of representing this idea. This is a prayer shawl. If you don't know what this is, it's got a lot of symbolism, 613 cords, 613 laws in the Torah. These tassels, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, five knots, four spaces, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. So when you have one of these on, this is given to the people of God to remind them of what God wants to do for them. But when the rabbis led services in the synagogue, they would hold this out as the wings of God. So when Jesus says he wants to shelter them under his wings like a mother hen gathers her children, just picture that. This is what Jesus wants to do for each one of us. The Jesus it's all about he longs to shelter us, protect us, save us, make us whole, restore us, heal us. This is his offer. He says it out loud. This is what I've longed to do. I've longed for this. But then it says in the passage, but you wouldn't let me. You wouldn't let me. Wow. I wonder if Jesus would ever lament his church in the same way. I wonder if he would have similar words for us. Oh, church, oh, church, I long to cover you like a mother hen under my wings, but you wouldn't let me. I long to heal you, restore you, build my kingdom among you, but you wouldn't let me. You've sent away God's messengers. You've refused my protection and care. You've accepted a counterfeit version instead. In the mid-1800s, William Holman Hunt painted this painting. It's a picture of Jesus standing by a door and knocking. You know this passage in Revelation, right? Um, this painting hangs in the 
St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. It depicts an overgrown, long, unopened door. Jesus is standing there knocking. He knocks to make this offer to anyone who will open the door, who will receive it. But William Hunt added a very important little detail to his painting. If you look at the door, there's no handle on the outside. Jesus cannot open the door. Only you can. Because you're on the other side. Jesus will not force his way in. Jesus will not break down the door. Jesus will not push on the door. He will not beg and plead. He will simply stand and knock and wait for you to take the handle and open the door and let him in. Wait for you to open the door and let's say, Jesus, I want you to shelter me under your wings like a mother hen. Now, some of you are sitting here thinking, saying, well, I did that a long time ago, Klein. I let him in a long time ago. I get it. But the thing is, Jesus keeps knocking. He always has more for us of himself. There's way more to Jesus than you probably have said yes to. He wants to give you way more of himself. He wants to give me way more of himself. But I have to keep opening the door. I have to keep saying yes. I have to keep saying, yes, Jesus, come on in, give me more, give me more, give me more. Show me how it's all about you, Jesus. Give me your presence, give me your power, give me your protection, give me your healing, give me your salvation. Change me, Jesus. So the question this morning is, will you do that? Will you open the door? Will you let him shelter you under his wings? If you need help with that, I'll be down in front afterwards. We'd love to help you, Pastor Greg. We'd love to help you figure out how to open that door. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're sorry that we've made it about a lot of other things. Help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on you and to be taken by you again. Most of all, Lord, help us to open the doors of our hearts and let you in. In your name we pray. Amen.